our first speaker tonight is Jillian Coles. And Jillian is a naturalist, a writer, and a photographer who's an expert at documenting um, the world of plants and their associates. Jillian has a superpower. She has the superpower of looking very closely at things and paying attention. And she's a consummate observer, and you're going to see the results of that in her talk. She's also a wonderful photographer. She started out taking pictures of plants, but she got distracted by all those insects and spiders that kept crawling around on the plants instead. She's the author of a wonderful book published in 2018 by Princeton University Press called Amazing Arachnids, which I highly recommend to you. But tonight she's going to give us a new perspective on plants in the Arizona flora. She's going to expand a little bit beyond spiders. She's going to talk about insects in general. And the vaguely sinister title of her talk is Partnerships and Betrayal, Plant-Insect Interactions. Thank you very much, Lynn, for such a wonderful introduction. And let's get started uh, right away. Uh, as she mentioned, the title of the talk is Partnerships and Betrayal, Plant-Insect Interactions. So let's get started with herbivory. Herbivory seems pretty uh, self-explanatory, but it's actually kind of complicated. Now, herbivory might be an insect simply chewing some leaves, or it could also be something like an aphid with uh, piercing, sucking mouth parts, sucking out the juices of a plant. In this particular case, you can see holes in this leaf chewed by this chrysomelid beetle. Now, this is a datura leaf. And deterrents, what they do is they have a direct uh, defense that they incorporate in their leaves, which are alkaloids, which are generally uh, toxic to most insects. But this chrysomelid beetle has evolved uh, ways of getting around those alkaloids. It either metabolizes them or sequesters those alkaloids. And so as a consequence, the deterrent plant might deploy a, an indirect defense where it emits volatile chemicals that call in parasites, uh, parasitoids, and predators that will attack this chrysomelid beetle. So that would be considered an indirect defense. Now, this indirect defense is actually tailor-made to the particular uh, herbivore that is attacking the plant because it's the uh, molecular signature from the saliva of the herb herbivore that tells the plant what kind of a cocktail to put out that's a volatile cocktail. So that it calls in specifically the parasites and predators that will attack that particular herbivore. Um, so not only does that plant put out this volatile cocktail of, of chemicals, but other plants in the area pick on those. Uh, volatile chemicals, and they also ramp up their defenses so that uh, surrounding plants also will increase their defensive um, capabilities as they uh, more or less eavesdrop on these volatile chemicals that are in the air. Now, not all herbivores are on the surface of the leaf. This, this one is on the surface, but this is the adult of a chrysomelid uh, leaf mining beetle. So its larva would actually be in the center of this leaf in the, between the layers of the leaf feeding on it. And you can see the, the areas where the miners uh, larva had been in this leaf. Not all the leaf miners are chrysomelid beetles. Some of them are weevils and some of them are microlips, tiny little moths. Now this is a leaf, an oak leaf from Garden Canyon. And you can see where this oak leaf, where the inside layers have been eaten out by a little caterpillar. And that caterpillar, when it matures, it's this tiny little three millimeter long, long microlip uh, moth. But once in a while, what you get emerging is a tiny little wasp. So this little wasp might have been called in by the uh, plant if it emitted some uh, volatile chemicals calling in parasitoids. And, and so this wasp would have come in and found that little caterpillar and parasitized it. Um, galls are another specialized form of herbivory, and galls can be formed by fungi and viruses and mites, but really the, the rock stars of the gall world are snippid wasps and tiny little midge flies. 
Um, now this is a snippet wasp. It's only about three millimeters long and snippet wasps produce a vast variety of different galls. You're probably familiar with what are called oak apples, but they also form these fuzzy galls, tiny little urn galls, and even spindle galls. There's many, many different kinds of galls, all different uh, species form different galls. And the other major group of gall forming insects are these gall midges. And so here's a couple of gall midges and some of the familiar galls that you might see are on salt bush plants, these fuzzy galls. And then creosote galls are also formed by a different species of gall midge. And here you have a, an a, a oak leaf with a different species of gall midge uh, gall on it. Now the plant, what happens when a gall encounter when a gall uh, wasp or a gall midge uh, forms a gall is it, it, it somehow injects a chemical in there that reprograms some of the um, growth of the plant so that the plant is basically uh, taken over to form a habitat for the offspring of that particular little insect. However, if early on in the process of the gall forming, if the plant detects that gall being there, it can deploy yet another uh, defense. And it is called a hypersensitivity reaction on the part of the plant. And what it'll do is kill the cells immediately under and around that uh, forming gall, and then it walls it off. And so that's called a hypersensitivity reaction from a plant. Now, some flies actually perform pollination services. So now we've covered herbivory, now we're gonna go into pollination. So here's an Aristolochia watsoni. It's the flower of the plant here. They're called pipe vines because they're shaped kind of like your old fashioned uh, pipe. The um, reproductive part of the plant is down in this pouch here. But the upper part of the plant you can see is this odd looking shape. And these are pollinated by a little biting fly which allegedly mistakes this flower for the ear of a rabbit or something like that. And it goes to bite that. And there's little hairs that point the fly down into that pouch. So down into this section. And so the little fly ends up down in the bottom of the pouch and it can't get out because of these downward pointing hairs. Well, the fly, if it had previously visited another Aristolochia flower, hopefully it's carrying some pollen. And in the case of course of it stumbling around in there, it'll hopefully brush up against the female part of the flower and deposit the pollen. A little later on, the male part of the plant will uh, mature and will release pollen. If the fly gets some pollen on it, a little bit later, the flower actually has the hairs wither and it allows the fly to escape. And therefore the fly can go and pollinate another flower. Now the real, uh, beneficiary of all this is a third party, which has nothing to do with the pollination, and that, that's a, a butterfly caterpillar, Batis philonor. And here you can see the caterpillars feeding on Aristolochia watsoni. This is the only food plant that they will feed on. And eventually when they mature, they're a beautiful butterfly. The real rock stars of the pollination, of course, are bees. And this is a megachyle bee, and they have a uh, pollen collecting hairs right here on the underside of their abdomen. These are uh, quite numerous and there's quite a few different species in our area, but they're also known as leaf cutter bees. And the reason why they're called leaf cutter bees is that they cut these disc shaped uh, holes out of leaves in order to line the cells of their brood chambers. Their brood chambers are of um, tubular brood chambers that usually some other insect had used like a, a leaf, uh, uh, a borer beetle or something like that. And so they line the inner part of that brood chamber with these leaves and they also use the leaves to uh, separate out the cells within the brood chamber. So they cut the leaf in a matter of a few seconds and then as they're dropping free, they have to kind of adjust their position and then they go flying off with the leaf. And by the way, I took all these photos of these leaf cutters without any special laser or anything like that. It's just hand and eye coordination, which is really difficult. Some leaf cutter bees uh, actually cut petals of globe mallows instead of 
uh, leaves. And so this particular species likes this caliche mallow, which it will use to line the brood chamber. Another famous bee in our area are the cactus bees, diadasia bees. Now these nest underground. They actually dig their own little burrow and they build a mud turret at the entryway of the burrow. And some of the turrets for some species point upwards like a little chimney. This one points sideways. So you can see the bee coming out of its little little brood uh, nest. And cactus bees use the pollen from prickly pears and choyas to uh, provision their nests. And these choyas and prickly pears have a very interesting property. If you look at this left one, all the anthers are snugged down to the center of the flower, whereas this one, the anthers are kind of out looser. And if you look at a totally undisturbed flower, the anthers are spread out. But if you run your finger around in there, they all snug down. So when the cactus bee visits the, the flower, the uh, um, prickly pear or choya flower, the anthers literally hug the bee and they cover it with pollen. And this is, assists the plant in getting pollinated. Now, once again, some of the beneficiaries of having these dazzy mutilla nests are third parties. And in this case, this little mutilid wasp nests in the dazzy mutilla nest. It lays its eggs in the nest of the bee and it usurps the nest for its own larva. And this bombaleid fly, what it does is it hovers over the dazzy mutilla nest and it flicks its eggs into the entry of the nest and its little maggots usurp the nest. And there's another kind of uh, nest usurper this is the leg of a diadasia bee. They, they collect the pollen on their fuzzy legs, but you'll see this orange thing stuck on there. And this orange thing is the larva of a beetle. And what it does is it waits on a flower, it hitches a ride on the diadasia bee, and then it, it rides to the nest and it disembarks in the nest. It takes over the, all the provisions, eats them up, and what emerges eventually would be a blister beetle. So, the lesson of that is that diversity begets diversity. For every species out there, there's probably some other species that depend on that for their resources. It's time to make a differentiation between pollination and visitation. Now, this particular sphinx moth is clearly providing a pollination service as it is drinking the nectar reward. And its little face is all covered with pollen, but this providing a pollination service to this particular flower. It's got a very long tongue and it can reach the nectar without getting any pollen on it. However, it probably would be the pollinator of something like this Mirabilis longiflora. Now this flower is a beautiful example of, of um, evolution where the flower is pushing the moth to have a longer and longer tongue and the moth is pushing the flower to have a longer and longer corolla. So it's co-evolution. Flowers and their pollinators are wonderful examples of co-evolution. Another example of a specialized pollination system is in orchids. Now this is a little parasitic orchid that grows up on the top of Mount Lemon. It's a spring coral root. And you can see these little maroon blobs on the other side of the flowers. These are the pollinia. And what the flower needs is to have its pollinator go in there and pick up the pollinia on the back of its thorax and then transfer that pollinia to another flower. So I staked out these flowers for quite a long time, many, many hours. And what I saw visiting for the most part were these little lazy aglossum bees, which I was all optimistic thinking that they were the pollinators. They go in repeatedly, one flower after another, very systematically, but unfortunately, every time they came out, there were no pollinia stuck on its, on its thorax. However, by chance, I also photographed right in that same area, some strawberry plants that were in bloom and being uh, visited by these tiny little surfeit flies. And if you look, there are some maroon blobs on the back of that surfeit fly. And you can see that these are maroon pollinia, which were very probably the spring coral root uh, pollinia. So this little surfeit fly might be the pollinator of that orchid. If you're proper 
pollinator, what you would do is go in through the front door of this uh, penstemon flower and stick your little in there and perform some pollination services when you get your nectar reward. But if you're a thief like this xylocopa bee, which is a carpenter bee, you cut a slit at the base of the flower and you steal the nectar reward without performing any pollination services. But insects aren't the only ones that cheat. Some plants also cheat. In the case of this comelina flower, it has three different types of anthers. These bright, very conspicuous anthers are basically fake ones. This central one has primarily fodder pollen because it's, all, it's still pretty conspicuous. It gives the insect a little something, but the real business end are these little inconspicuous anthers down here. The Calypso orchid really carries uh, cheating to the extreme because as I noted earlier, orchids use pollinia to transfer pollen. And this thing has what looks like anthers, but these are completely fake. And any naive bee that visits very quickly discovers that it doesn't get much of a reward. So the only way that these orchids get pollinated is by very naive bees that visit only a very few flowers before they give up and quit visiting. So it's a strategy of diminishing returns. Yuccas have a very specialized system of pollination. Uh, this is yucca elata, and you can see it has very abundant flowers. And at night, a little tiny yucca moth visits it. Now, what it does is it brings some pollen with it from another flower, and it first of all deposits some eggs in the ovary of the flower, and then it very deliberately carries the pollen in a special structure and deposits it on the stigma of the flower. And in that way, it pollinates it. Now, the key thing about yucca moths is that if they deposit too many eggs in that ovary, and what their little larva will feed on are the developing seeds in that ovary. But if they deposit too many eggs, the yucca will abort the fruit. And so greed doesn't pay. The, the yucca will simply say, this is, this is not working for me, and will abort the fruit, and nobody wins. So this is a case of obligate mutualism. The yucca has only one pollinator, it's a moth, and the moth absolutely depends on the yucca for a food for its source for its larva. Ants have a very specialized relationship with plants. They have a very complex and, and interesting relationship. This is a barrel cactus with a bud on it, and it has extra floral nectaries in order to bribe ants to come and chase away any herbivores that might chew up those flowers. However, like the mafia, they the ants can be paid off by anybody with a sweet treat. And so here the ants are actually protecting herbivores, these little aphids, and in return getting uh, paid off with these uh, honeydew from the aphids. Now, this isn't all bad because sometimes the presence of the ants means that the ants chase off other herbivores. So even though the plant has some aphids and has to give up something in order to keep these aphids there, the aphids then lure the ants, the ants chase away other herbivores, and in the end result, the plant might actually benefit from these aphids being there. And some plants have root aphids. So all the stuff that I've been talking about that happens above surface, also comparable stuff happens below surface. So there's root aphids, ants, there's uh, roots that if they get chewed on, they uh, emit volatile chemicals that call in predaceous nematodes and all sorts of things like that. So, so the below ground is just as exciting as above ground. Now, another herb of war that has a relationship with ants are the lichenid butterflies. So almost all of lichenid butterflies, their caterpillars have relationships with ants. In this case, this little caterpillar has uh, a, a sugary treat it can give to the ant in exchange for the protection of the ant. And if some, some predator starts harassing that little caterpillar, it can actually squeak and call for help to the ant. Uh, leaf cutter ants have a special relationship. They cut leaves and gather flowers, and they gather them and, and leave them around the top of the burrow to let them dry out just a little bit. So that's a typical leaf cutter nest. And then what they do is they carry the, that plant material below, and they use that to farm fungus. They don't feed on these plant material directly. What they feed on is a fungus that they grow on this plant material. And these leaf cutter, these acromyrmix, uh, acromyrmix 
ants are thought to have been doing this for about 6 million years. That far predates our roughly 10,000 years of uh, agriculture. Um, they're true farmers. The fungus that they grow is thought to be millions of years old, the clones that they grow. Harvester ants, the Pogonomermix ants, are another group that are involved with gathering seeds and plant material. They eat some of those seeds, but they also aerate the soil and they provide food for uh, animals such as this horned lizard, which primary food source for horned lizards are Pogonomermix ants. Uh, the turrets have a very special system going with ants, a relationship with them. Uh, this is the turret discolor with the deep purple flashes in the throat and the long spines on the fruit. And the turret right eye with the plain white flowers and the smaller spines on the fruit. Now the turret seeds are very special. They have this odd little, little food body attached to the seed that can be detached rather easily. This food body is sometimes called an eliasome, although eliasome technically means oil body. And in the case of the datura, it has very little lipid in there. So I'll go with the word food body. But this little food treat is very attractive to ants. So this is a Nova Messer cockerelli, which has encountered some datura seeds and it immediately gets a hold of these seeds. Sometimes they'll eat the food body right away, but more often, they carry the seed off to the nest. And when they carry the seed to the nest, that not only disperses the seeds, but it carries them away from under the datura plant. This is highly beneficial to the datura seed because while well, the seed is under the datura plant, it is susceptible to predation by rodents that like to forage for seeds under the cover of datura plants. Once the seed is carried off to the open area of the ant nest, the seed is much safer actually. And so the plant and the ant have worked out this mutualistic relationship where the ant carries away the seed from the area of danger and in exchange, it gets the little food body. So I'd like to finish up with a couple final thoughts. And that is, first of all, that diversity begets diversity, that whenever one species is there is around, there's very likely other species that use that as a resource for themselves. And the flip side of that is that when you uh, eliminate a species, you're probably gonna lose a few others along with it. The other thought that I wanna leave you with is that evolution through natural selection is usually thought of as this knockdown, drag out fight of competition. And what I see among our desert plant communities and the insects that, that live with them is a lot of mutualism and cooperation and sharing. And this seems to run counter to what you think of for evolution, but really evolution doesn't care. It just says whatever works is what gets selected for. So if cooperation works for a species, then that's what gets selected for. And it's something to think about because uh, our native plants have worked out all the rules living with their neighbors, with their insects and other plants. And uh, so when you plant native plants, you're really helping to be a good neighbor as well. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jillian. That was really a, a, a quick trip through a lot of information, but what cool stuff. Um, so one of the questions we had was about the photography and, and how you have managed to get these amazing photographs and, and what kind of photographic in, uh, materials you use, what kind of camera you use over there. So people would like to know that. Okay, I use a, a Canon uh, EOS 6D, I think it's called. And I use a Sigma ring flash. Now it's really not a ring flash. It really has two flashes uh, attached to the front of the lens. And, um, and I just basically use a lot of patience. I do use a macro lens and I use a super macro lens. Uh, for the ant pictures, I use a super macro lens, which is an MPE 65 millimeter. It has no autofocus. So you have to really, really, uh, you have to be very good with hand and eye coordination. So that's really the trick is, it's kind of like playing tennis. You just get out there and you practice, practice and that's the way you do it. <laughs> right. 
We had another question asking about what's the pollinator for the night blooming cereus? That would probably be a uh, sphinx moth as well, I would think. I think, but uh, because it's going to be a night night flying animal, um, and those flowers are pretty far and few between. I, I suppose that um, nectar feeding bats could visit them. I don't see any reason why they wouldn't, but I suspect strongly that it's sphinx moths that are their main pollinator. But I'm only guessing at that. I haven't actually sat out and watched a uh, night bloomer all night to see what visits. Okay, we have another question. Um, most daturas are toxic to humans. Is that not true? Or can humans eat, for instance, the seeds and be uh, do not, uh, Okay, right. So do not eat the tura seeds. Oh, <laughs> seeds. <laughs> um, Rodents do eat the seeds. And um, don't ask me how they manage that. But, but um, the seeds themselves on the turret discolory were analyzed and they didn't, the seeds, oddly enough, didn't have very much in the way alkaloids. And apparently the, the rodents do eat them. But I would not um, recommend eating any seeds from, from a human standpoint. Um, our Southwest has relatively few uh, uh, seeds that are dispersed by ants, but in some areas like Australia, apparently almost a third of the plants are um, have a food body attached and they are dispersed by, by ants. So some areas of the world, ant dispersal is a very big deal for seeds. Another one of our audience asks about how many plants don't set seed, maybe because something like yucca moths are implanting eggs in the, in the ovary. So I guess the larger question is, what's the cost of all this herbivory on the plant? Oh, that's a very good question. Actually, it's, it's a very complicated question too, because there are trade-offs. For example, um, sometimes herbivory may, might trigger a reaction that could be beneficial to the plant in the sense that it might help defend it against a, a bacterial infection or something like that. So, so it's something that's, that it, everyone has thought needs to be studied, but it's very, very difficult actually in natural systems where there's bacteria, fungi, herbivorous insects, uh, the plants themselves, and it's really hard to tease out any one variable and and figure out what the exact cost and benefit is apart from all those other variables. We have another question and uh, well, a couple questions actually about, about galls. Uh, one member of the audience wanted to know if you could just re summarize again exactly what you mean when you say a gall, that's kind of a general term. And then another um, audience member wanted to know is, are, can you recommend some good places to read more about galls? She'd like to know more oh. about <laughs> wasps and midges that cause galls and which plants get galled and so oh, okay 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 so galls are basically where the tissue of the plant has been reprogrammed and it's a very localized area of the tissue and a, a uh, an insect can inject a chemical in there that somehow reprograms that that tissue so that the meristematic tissue so that the tissue will will form this this gall this at this this structure that has been uh, architecturally drawn up by the insect rather than the plant. It's using the plant tissues for it, but it's it's basically a plan drawn out by the, the insect. Um, good sources for information on galls are Bug Guide online. If you go to Bug Guide and look under the snippet wasps and the, um, some of the gall midges, you'll see examples of galls from, from the United States. There used to be a book out by a University of California Press that was a field guide on California galls. Unfortunately, that is no longer in print as far as I know, and it's very expensive as it used to copy. So galls are a real tough subject. Um, there's a guy named uh, Charlie Eisman who does a blog and uh, a website called Bug Tracks, and he he posts a lot of material about galls, but principally galls in the northeastern part of the country. And another question about galls, wondering if they can be ever caused by viruses. Sometimes they are, yes. Uh, they can be caused by viruses, fungi, mites, any number of different organisms can cause galls. 
So it's a really, really interesting area. Okay. I think we're going to have to leave it at that for now um, because we need to move on to our next speaker. But okay. thank you so much, Jillian, for and thank you very much. Amazing uh, insight into these great interactions. That's awesome. So. Thanks.